talking to Lady Melzer and Book Bunch 45. And we're going to be talking about uh, mental health. We're going to be talking about anxiety, depression, um, various other things uh, to do with childhood abuse. Um, and then later we're going to be talking about some lighter things in terms of 45s that lift the spirits and also some confectionery because we I've got a sweet tooth and I know some of my guests have got a sweet tooth as well. So um, let's bring my guests in. We're going to start with uh, Demelza first of all. Uh, how are you today? Hello. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Very hot. Very hot. It is very hot. And we're, we're in this sort of middle of this um, heat wave or yeah. what's supposed to be a heat wave. Um, I don't know. I like it. Do you like the heat? Um, oh, uh, I, yeah, in Spain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, the UK when it's hot like this is beautiful, but um, we just I think we all really struggle with it, don't we? We, we cope when we're abroad, but not so much when we're in the UK. <laughs> We're just not quite set up for it. Oh, I don't think the sort of air, the no. buildings are sort of air conditioned, or you know, we don't. You sort of everyone's diving for a fan, aren't they, to try and keep cool? And, and it's so difficult to sleep at night in this heat. That's which doesn't really help. Um, right, and we've also got Phil Sucker Punch Forty Fives. How are you doing today? Yeah, really good. Likewise, quite warm, but uh, yeah, all good. Thank you very much. Cool uh we've got one of our regular viewers and also a guest who came on before mark lancaster welcome mark good to see you um and it was mark who came up with the idea about you know 45s that lift the spirits so um yeah thank you mark we'll, we'll come to that later on and then we've got double p who inspired the show in the first place so you know big shout out to uh paul pitt there and our oh, constance how are you doing right so um let's start with you Demelza. so um you know I, i've seen you dj on twitch i know probably quite a lot of our our viewers have, have seen you you know w when did you first sort of get into djing when did you sort of get into 45s and you know what sort of music are you particularly keen on um well i've i've only been actually in public doing it uh for about three years now um i have had ducks for a really long time um, and um, have dabbled for many, many years, probably since I discovered rave music um, and uh, was always kicked off the decks by the boys and kind of never felt I was good enough and just had a bit of a transitional period in my life. Always bought records, uh, predominantly 12s. Um, and yeah, probably been into 45s on and off, but um, kind of took it a bit more seriously um, about three or four years ago. So um, yeah, and just went all in and uh, went crazy. So yeah, yeah. it's definitely an addiction, is it? Um, so were you just into the rave music, or were did you used to go raving? Like I was a else? raver, yeah, yeah, I was a raver. <laughs> so I, I've, I've always loved and been around music. Um, my mum has always had music on, um, and I went through. <laughs> So I was really into like Hendrix and uh, when I was sort of my te uh, very early teenage years, um, Oxblood, Dr. Martins, Scar, huge Scar yeah. fan, love uh, Scar music. Um, and so one day my friend was like, look, we're going to go to this new club. <clears throat> Do you want to come? And I was like, I've got no money. Um, and she said, well, you know, sell something. And I went, oh, OK. And I was like, <laughs> what do I want to sell? And um, I sold my Oxblood, Dr. Martins so um <laughs> and i sold them and and i went to my first rave and uh i remember i wore my mum had this fluorescent pink silk uh jumpsuit uh, i've always loved clothes as well so um they're quite big and uh yeah i just watched this rave and i was just like wow what is this this is this is immense um and yeah it just blew me away and then i i, I was quite young that was only 14 but um yeah so then I became a hard raver. There was quite a rave scene in Cornwall as well. It was it was quite a big scene. I, yeah, I've, I've heard that actually. Um, so what, so was that an official event or was it something that was? Um... Yeah, it was in it was in a club called the Shire Horse, um, which is near St Ives or in St Ives, just just at the right. top of the. Um, it's it's been bulldozed now, but uh, yeah, it was just this. All the best clubs have. Oh, it was just this sweaty little box. You know, it wasn't anything special, but it was just a coming together you know it's it was it was it was just amazing the whole time and the period and then we would all uh we would all meet at Hale garage and we would all go to a phase two so we would all go in convoy to the phase two a lot of the travelers would put on the phase two so there's a lot of, of, of traveler camp right. 
in and around. Um, there was a specific crew called the Wetback Crew who were putting the, the raves on at the Shire. Um, they are doing 30 years. It's their 30, 30th anniversary, and they've asked me to go down and play in August. So, wow. yeah, which is really lovely. And I, I don't, I'm not really, I don't really play kind of, I play kind of house music sometimes, but I'm a bit more disco yeah. house. But um, so I, I used to spend a lot of my time in the chill out room. So that's kind of where I'm going to go. Um, but yeah, yeah no, yeah. Really I feel really blessed that they asked me. And, uh, you know, I mean, I was I was so young when I used to rave as well. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, big DJs. I remember Carl Cox would come down and like we'd have parties yeah. on the beach afterwards and, and yeah, all yeah. DJs will come and play at the parties afterwards. Uh, Digweed, um, Easy Groove, you know, all, all of that kind of era. So, yeah, that's that's where I come to. But I had a, uh, you know, I, I would hear breakbeats in things. And my friend's brother was was big into hip hop. Um, and that got me. The drums were like, you know, any and, and a lot of rave uh, tunes that have got drums and stuff. I'd be, you know, buzzing when I heard it and then kind of explored into the world of hip hop a bit more. Yeah, I guess it's a bit of a transition. Um, Mark Lancaster says he remembers seeing that club and saying, oh, do you remember bumping into Mark Lancaster at the club in the chill out room? To be honest, I, I don't remember a whole, a whole lot about, no. about that era, to be honest. I remember it being amazing and being amongst my friends and, and having yeah. fun. Obviously there were there were certain things that came with raving that, uh, yeah, we, we tell our children not to do uh, now. Yeah. Um, but you know it's part and parcel of it, and and you know I wouldn't change it for the world. The, I've got lifelong friends, you know, that I made that I am yeah. still friends with now. You know, and that's that's yeah. It's it's um it's a bit like an early community, isn't it? Really, because again, it was bringing everyone together uh, with music and for for a cause. And obviously back then we didn't have the sort of you know diversions of the internet or mobile phones or everything else you know it's like right what should we do let's go to a party you know and then there'd be like a rave and you go along and you just meet like-minded people which is you know very yeah. similar to what we're doing on on twitch and on the online community so it's sort of the you know the the late 20th century equivalent of what we're doing now in a way um yeah i, I think we won't we'll leave it there fat wax <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Maybe right see you <laughs> yeah. phil so um yeah i mean were, were, were you a raver were you a raver back in the day no not a massive raver uh to be honest with you uh fortunate enough to have a really good set of, of mates at the time and we we do a lot of gigs we would be gigging um a good couple of times a week seeing everybody and anybody that we could yeah you yeah. know turning up early seeing the support act loving the support act going back trying to find their 45s, their records and whatever. Um, so, yeah, that, it was more of that. Yeah, there was some clubbing involved and there was some of that, but it was uh, it was a lot of a lot of gigs, as I remember. And is that still, you, you're sort of uh, Winchester now, aren't you? Sorry? You, you're sort of Winchester-based now. Is, it, is that in the same area or were you somewhere else when you were younger? Um, it was sort of Leatherhead, Dorking Way in Surrey. So good connections, the train line straight into Waterloo and... Uh, when we were a bit older and we could drive it was straight up the a3 and into london so we were we were very lucky very lucky from here it's more down to southampton or portsmouth if people go that way yeah yeah i mean london's yeah, great uh, drive yeah. and also club capital really you know there's so much well there was you know i'm sure it all yeah up. yeah it's, i mean there um, were some, some great places we'd be in the astoria probably you know yeah once a week or the town and country club and you know places yeah. like that all the time and it was yeah like second homes almost yeah the story was a great great club yeah such a cool yeah. place well i had the club cool. underneath so you could you yeah could see the band you see the band and when they yeah. kicked off at 11 you'd go downstairs and you'd go to the club afterwards so yeah um, yes yeah. yeah. i remember we used to sit sort of at the top it also sort of be like a race I think, I think that's why i saw um i saw daft punk there um must be 95 something like that you know it was, it was just after the defunct had come out and a little bit later that um yeah it was, a, it was a great venue so another venue that mark lancaster's been to the store was my favorite venue yeah it's a real shame they had to sort of knock yeah. it down uh, and what about you so what 45s when did you get into 45s probably a similar amount of time um three or four three or four years ago really um you know as we might touch on later from a mental health point of view 
I just had it with screens. I'd had a bad time and needed to get off screens. And at that point, I'd started to pick up paperback books again and read them or comics probably more often. And uh, yeah, 45s and re playing records again was, was something that, that really appealed. My problem was that the 45s I had, the records I had were linked to memories from the past and I, I couldn't play them couldn't play them so at that point I had to find something new to play and yeah that's that's sort of where it started from there really did you did you end up getting rid of the 45s um, it was um the start of the journey was Craig Charles Funk and Soul show and yeah. he he just made um the allergies second album uh push yeah. on his album yeah. of the year and I'd never heard of them and I'd never heard of anything like it. So I put it on and it, it blew me away. And from there, I went to see them at a really small festival, if you can call it a festival, in Reading called Ready Pop. And there was probably somewhere between 30 or 40 of us in a tent um, watching the allergies play for 45 minutes. It was, I mean, it was such a classy um festival i think goldie looking in chain with the uh, headliners you know it was right. that kind of that kind of do um yeah, yeah. but again yeah. it just blew me away i mean there was a couple of djs on beforehand that were playing funk and soul and hip-hop and even they i was even them they just blew me away and that that was it that was really the, the start of the journey and now uh, i want to play 45 so i want to do that yeah it's it's it's, an, it's definitely an addiction isn't it i mean it's it's um <clears throat> I, don't know, I think it's just the simplicity of it isn't it you know it's just one track on each side um and you know it's normally the generally a single so it's normally the best track that that particular album or that particular artist has put out so that there's something quality about it rather than sort of you know endless remixes or downloads of you know current chart hits so right the mail's on can come back to you um i'm gonna go a little bit deeper now deeper than your rave sort of thing so um Okay, I mean, we, I've said to you at the beginning, you know, before we started that, you know, maybe we'll sort of go sort of a bit chronological and sort of, sort of work through. Um, I, I think you described to me that obviously that you sort of grew up with a sort of background of domestic violence and sort of experiencing that. I mean, yeah. you know, when when did that start? You know, what sort of age and, you know, uh, how time? From, from birth, really, unfortunately, um, up until uh, I was five and um, when when he left. So, um, yeah, and, uh, you know, I grew up in Cornwall um, and we grew up really poor. Um, my mum worked really hard. Um, I had a phenomenal childhood. I've been really lucky. Number one, growing up in Cornwall. Um, I yeah. think if, if you're poor to grow up anywhere, you know, I'd, I'd rather grow up there. Um, and, you know, and, and I've always been, my mum has always loved me. And I know that that's, you know, I've always felt very secure. I've always had very good you know attachment uh things with with her you know she she she's been through a lot we've all been through a lot you know um so but that shapes us and, and weirdly what I'm kind of finding out is I've been okay my whole life you know there's been stuff that um I've struggled with um but as you get older I, I kind of thought as you get older you figure everything out and you get to understand everything so it's going to be okay so um but what i'm realizing is actually it's not you start unpicking stuff and it becomes more complex and deeper and i mean i don't have children of my own I, i've got foster kids but um you know when you're dealing with stuff you you start to uh, uh realize that you know maybe things aren't okay and uh you know you you don't deal with stuff particularly well yeah but yeah, it, I think I think as you get old, like you say, I think you think, well, I'm going to become an adult, and I'm going to understand everything, and everything's going to make sense. But it, but it, it doesn't, doesn't it? And and like you say, it, it your brain thinks more about everything that's gone on. I mean, um, have you found yourself as you've got older going back and sort of re going over things that happened when you were that young? Yeah, I think so, and I, I think it's affected my relationships uh, with partners and stuff. Um, I. I you know, I, I've I've had I've had some really good relationships, but um, I yeah I I think there's definite effects that it has had on me and the way that I deal with situations. And I mean, the good thing is I kind of try and 
learn from it and and realize it and try and work on it because you kind of have to work on yourself all the time don't you um Mm. it's really hard to kind of change yourself after you've been that way for such a long time um but yeah I, i think it does it 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 does impact you definitely and um you know it's impacted my my sisters and and you know my mum bless her she's you know she's been she's an incredible woman she's been through a lot a lot in her life a lot of domestic violence um she knows how how to pick them <laughs> um yeah. i'm not a psycho girlfriend i will just put that out there if anybody you know interested i'm not completely mental but <laughs> but um yeah you know life is life is difficult life's difficult for everybody and um you yeah. know everyone everyone's issues are relative aren't they no matter what i mean it's what i found really difficult is um i've got incredible friends that i grew up with and they all grew up with both parents and were financially sound you know they they had holidays they had everything they ever wanted and i never went without but you know there were things i couldn't have that they had um and um they haven't ever experienced anxiety they don't get the fear and I thought everyone had that I thought that that was just normal for everybody to panic about situations you know I would panic if I broke something at a friend's house and get really um really upset (laughs) sorry I'm just reading Mr Musto's Mr Thing comment um and you know I'd realize that you wouldn't get shouted at for those things it's just an accident and stuff And, and that that happens in 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 older you know I get really frightened if something happens but I'm trying to learn, you know, like if I break something or accidentally make a mistake. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's, yeah, I guess that's interesting. You know, like you're saying, coming from not having anything to then thinking, well, if you break something that belongs to someone else, then obviously that's going to potentially have an impact on them. But it's understanding yeah. that these things happen. And, you know, so has that anxiety always been with you? Or yeah, is that sure. That I know my my mum was always anxious because of the situation we were living in uh financially she struggled but she you know she worked really hard she worked in the fields um my mum's severely dyslexic and and struggles with reading writing um but she's an incredible woman and you know she powered through I never went without don't get me wrong you know I I my mum I we were the poorest but I was the best dressed kid on the on the on the uh, playground my mum learnt to sew you know my mum taught herself to sew and we used to go to jumble sales and she's incredibly creative so you know there's I've got whilst there's some big scary horrible memories I've got some really amazing memories as well so yeah and you've still got I mean you were saying earlier that you've still got a really good relationship and you sort of work with your mum as well at the moment I'm, I'm in business saying. with her yeah and we live together yeah, yeah. great with my three foster children and the five dogs so yeah it's a big hand. You're in your summer house tonight. Which, I'm in my um, summer house. Yeah, this, is, this is our little kind of hideaway away from the house, our little piece of solace. Yeah, well, you need that. You need that little break sometimes, don't you, just to have a bit of me time yeah. um, and read your books. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll come back a little bit after we've spoken to Phil. Um, Phil, so um, again, not quite in the same way, but again, again, you sort of said to me that, you know, you had quite a lot of difficulties, you know, with your childhood experiences as well. Um, when, when did that sort of start for you? And, you know, what did it consist of? And how did you well, not deal with it? But you know, how, how did it affect you at that time? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting here and what Demelza just said about uh, sort of how it hits you later in life, because actually, it wasn't until my daughter reached uh, a similar age to when I'd experienced the issues that we had at home that it really hit home that my my goodness I was that young and I was having to deal with the the, the fights that used to go on between my mum and my dad and the yeah the the situations that my mum would put put me in whilst um, she was enjoying herself away from my dad and you know I'd I'd be she'd be having affairs with people and I would be sat downstairs playing with toy cars while she was upstairs and you just didn't realize at the time that you were in that kind of situation you know mm-hmm. yes yes I would go to school and cry to the teacher because yeah the night before I'd heard my dad knock my mum down the stairs and um, my dad had taken the scissors to to her hair and, and things like that and you know you wake up with that you hear it you listen to it and then you know the next morning 
they try and pretend that nothing's happened and you're not going to talk about it and then you just go to school and just yeah, just just lose it with the next responsible adult I guess that you consider might look out for you because your parents certainly aren't and uh, so it, it took until my my daughter Beth got to around about the age of nine that the situation sort of really hit me that yeah the kind of things uh, that went on did but um, I mean primarily it went back to um, my parents had me to try and stabilize their relationship um, and it didn't work so I think in the eyes of my father I was always the symbol of that marriage failing and he never wanted anything to do with me my mum moved on to her new relationship and that was her focus um, so as a as a nine-year-old I was picked up and put in a very strange environment new school new friends remember distinctly having to leave the family dog behind because we couldn't take the dog with us which actually broke my heart that I wasn't worried about leaving my dad but leaving my dog was the, the worst thing that could possibly happen and you know and having that core belief that I was just I was useless I'd failed and that core belief stays with me to until today that you know I'm not good enough um, I have you know whatever that situation is I wake up most mornings expecting my wife to leave me or uh, me to lose my job or whatever else because my core belief is that I'm just not good enough that, and my parents yeah bred that belief by the way they mistreated me or had nothing to do with me when when I was when I was young and um, you know when I was growing up I'd have girlfriends but it wouldn't be that I would have girlfriends I would have families I would desperately want surrogate families to look after me and 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 do the things that normal families would do you know get up at on Christmas morning or go on holiday or go to the cinema or go to football or whatever all the things that I'd missed out on my parents hadn't really done so you know yeah that's what it that's what it went back to and that's where it came from I mean back, back then obviously when you when you would go to a responsible adult in your school you know was the help there did, did that help in any way or were you brushed aside at that time I know things have moved on I would hope quite a lot since then but you know how, how was it yeah. dealt with that? I think you're right I think it was dealt with very differently then to how how it would be now um, I think there's a lot of people in my life that feel very guilty that they didn't challenge my parents about what was going on people that were incredibly supportive incredibly um i had a, a football manager uh, from the age of 10 through to 16 and and he was him and his wife were just brilliant with me you know they would regularly pick me up and you know take me places and if i was in a school production they would come and watch me because my parents wouldn't and and they really stepped in and there were a lot of people you know friends and, and other families that stepped in but what they didn't do and what I hope is different now that is that they didn't they didn't confront they didn't raise it with my parents yeah. so you know it was they were they were wonderful to me and they, they did everything they could to fill the gaps and, and make up for the deficiencies you know of, of my parents but none of them challenged none, none of the rest of the family challenged it was all sort of brushed under the carpet yeah, yeah, just can't, just can't imagine, really. Um, and it's and it's interesting that you're saying that. Obviously, that that has carried through e even to 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 now. From what you're saying, you know, you're, you're concerned that you know things might happen now. Or, I mean, is, is it yeah. always sort of expecting the worst? Is that? Yeah, is that always. I mean, they, I I catastrophize everything. Everything is a is a is a, a catastrophe in the making. Um, if if i have an argument say with my wife to me my mind goes to i've had an argument she's unhappy she's going to leave she's going to take my daughter we're going to lose the house and i get to that point very very quickly from a very minor starting point from yeah. a very from a very low base if you like from a very minor disagreement and part of part part of 
my my makeup now is to try and do everything to avoid confrontation to avoid those situations but if i get in them then i catastrophize and it takes it all the way through to everybody leaving and being on my own and, and things yeah. like that and i think i was saying that um, when i would go and hang out with my friends who's who had normal families you know they had their mum and their dad and you know they they did all these lovely things um they would sometimes fall out and I would watch them argue and interact and they would argue and then it would be okay and it would be fine and I'd be like almost like cowering in the corner thinking oh my god you know what's is someone gonna get hit or is someone gonna um is it gonna break up or you know what this is the end this is this is awful so mm -hmm. and and that's an anxiety that I do still carry now I'm, I'm getting better with it but in relationships as well I've, I know I've certainly I've been really frightened when I've had arguments because I, I, that whole they're going to leave me thing, we've had an argument. But actually, you know, having watched other normal people have those arguments, actually, I can see you can have discussions and be heated, and nobody gets hit or nobody gets, you know, abused or left or or, or abandoned. So you know, that's that's that is quite difficult. And you know, I, I completely feel you feel for for that whole the attach. It's the attachment stuff, isn't it? You know, people leave. That's what happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's interesting because what you say there about being surprised that it doesn't other people's arguments don't escalate into you know Armageddon and and everything else is actually the other side. I grew up without hugs or 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 any kind of you know there was no tactile sort of relationship. So when you saw other families hugging and then want to try and hug you, it was very much stand off because. I haven't seen this. I don't know this. Is this normal? This doesn't seem normal to me. This isn't my normal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you've got that both sides. You think the argument's going to go ballistic and everything's going to end. And the other side is, no, 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 stay away from me. I'm, I'm, that's, not, that's not what I'm used to. I don't know that. And it's funny. I, I, and, um, I, I love giving uh, to people. I love cooking and I love buying gifts for people I love making people it's quite a selfish act because it makes me feel really happy you know and it, you know it's, it's kind of that's what I like to do and you know my foster kids I would um I'd spend ages going and, and buying their Christmas presents and finding really lovely things and I would wrap them up and I would spend so long on these things and then I would be really excited and I'd give them to them and they would pick them up and they would put them on the table and it just took me so long to kind of understand that they hadn't had Christmas presents before. They hadn't had that before. So they don't know what to do with it. I'm there all excited. And then I would feel really hurt and pissed off with them because I'd be, are you ungrateful? You know, and it, and it took me a while to kind of process that actually, you know, they, they didn't get Christmas presents. They don't get nice things. So, you know, they don't, they didn't know what to do with it. And it's, mm. you know, it's a, a big lesson. And I guess it's that social construct isn't it you know I mean unless you have had that like you say from a young age and it's sort of built into people isn't it well you know th you know someone gives you something this is how you react and and all the rest of it but it's only like you say when you get to the point where someone hasn't had that and they just don't know how to react necessarily um I mean you spoke about foster children when when did you start fostering um and, and you know what got got you into it my mum started it. My mum started, um, so I moved, uh, or she moved up to Exeter in 97 from Cornwall, um, and she started doing it then. And um, so I've kind of always been around it. And then I kind of split with a partner and I moved back to Cornwall and I, I sort of dotted around for a bit. And then I moved back to Exeter um, and kind of fell into it really. It wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't my favorite thing. and. Uh, it's um yeah I, I just ended up doing it because I was living with her and and yeah now we, we both do it and and I only I only do um 16 to 24 year olds um so uh I'm always say give me give me a, a kid high on drugs and alcohol any day over a baby um so yeah I, I deal with with a lot of complex kids a lot of complex mm. kids and and you know you, you've they've been that way for 16 years you know they yeah. they come to me quite often some of them are new to care as well you know some of them only come into care at 16 um so and yeah i i kind of i i deal with some horrific situations or, or kids that have come from horrific situations that mm. you 
sometimes might read about um and i i become a bit clinical to it because it's it's just part of you know what what i do really yeah you have to i mean you know you're asking me before about you know some some of the work that i do and um it's the same with me you know you you have to sort of almost switch off in a way the reality of what, what what's going on um how, how does that affect your mental health you know having to sort of do you know it, it can be um, really it can be really shit sometimes and you know i'm dealing with um my own stuff going on and i've got i mean today mm. i i've got a, a couple of girls at the moment who are really challenging and um i know it's not personal but i get verbally abused on a daily basis you know i told how yeah. how how crap i am how i never do anything for anybody and um and if i'm feeling crap that that sometimes does affect me you know if i'm feeling okay i can process it but i mean i've i've had i've had some pretty rough rides here with with some of the kids um i um was uh, i sadly lost a baby um oh. years ago now but um and the night before i i had the miscarriage the um the the kid who we had here was he was just awful he was a really you know i'm there's I've got time for everybody in the world and and I know that there's lots of people, lots of problems, um, but there are just some people that are unfortunately just going to be that way their whole lives. And he was just awful and he was really verbally aggressive to me the night before. I had to phone the police and it, it was just a really harrowing yeah. time. Um, and then obviously I had, I, I had the miscarriage the next day and that's... Um, you know, it happens. It's, it's life. It's, you know, it's, it's what sometimes happens, but yeah. So I, I kind of have been through some stuff with, with that, but you know, all in all, I have to remember that my life is good. And as much as I want to help these kids and sometimes I can, and sometimes I can't, I've got to remember that my life is good and I, I I've got a good life and, and I'm happy and um, you know, I'm, I'm able to, move away from things you know especially when they're being horrendous to me um you just have to step back and go you know it's it's I feel sorry for them because like life's going to be really hard for them um you know and it's it is really sad I want to save them all so you know they're real characters some of them they're they're yeah. little bugs and they're you know sneaking their mates in and like teenagers do all the normal teenage stuff um but they've got the added layer of the complex you know issues of, yeah. of maybe the abuse they've come from in one varying degree, neglect. Um, yeah, some horrible, horrible stories. Yeah. I feel for you about the miscarriage stuff. You know, we've been through it in my wife and yeah, yeah it's not easy and to have to deal with that on top of it. Must yeah. Really it's hard. It's really hard. hard. I think, yeah, it was, a t I went through a really tough time and, and my partner that I was with at the time, uh, we went through a really difficult time because of various things and yeah, but it's, you know, I know it's cliche, but it is life and it does happen. And, and you know, it's sad. And But what can we do? We, we have to move on, don't we? It's Yeah, you have to try and be strong and sort of, yeah, move on. Because otherwise you, you just give up and... Yeah. Know. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, Phil, um, you mentioned when we... You know, when I was asking you about things that you know you'd like to talk about, you mentioned that um, because of your uh, mental health issues, you you had a condition, and obviously you ended up in in the priory. I think for a little while you said, um, you know, w w did you have a diagnosis, and and how did that come about, and and what was it like sort of going to the priory, and did that help ultimately? The the priory was a was an experience that whilst you don't want to go through it it was it was enlightening in some ways i met some of the strongest people nicest people um in the priory um and it, it, it wasn't the rock stars and football priory it was yeah a slightly more basic version than that but mm -hmm. It, it was it was a real challenge it it makes you talk about things the place makes you talk about things it it brings brings things out you discover what your core beliefs are what what is driving uh why you're feeling um i was deemed a suicide risk 
uh, at the time I'd, I'd had some counseling I'd had various other bits and pieces that hadn't really worked the medication was just going up and up and wasn't working um, it was putting all kinds of stresses and strains on other parts of my life whether it was my relationship at home or my job so um, one of the counsellors I was seeing uh, at the time the psychiatrist I was seeing at the time uh, referred me uh, and got me into the priory and um, yeah so it was very challenging it was it was very scary at times um, but it was very humbling um, there are some sadly very unwell individuals and, and some of the they almost fell into two categories there were people my age and there were late teens early 20s and the, the late teens and the early 20s were just it was just tragic to see the situations that they were in and how they were feeling and what they were going through so it, it was humbling um i met some some really great people friend people i'm friends with now and remain friends with um sadly we lost a couple uh, along the way which was devastating absolutely <coughs> devastating um but you know it's it's out there people are are facing these these situations and have these conditions and yeah it, it's it's very sad now how long were you there for? Uh, yeah. uh, i was there for six months okay and obviously living in there and you know what i mean for someone that doesn't know you know what is the setup have you, have you got your sort of own room are you seeing a psychiatrist are you getting group therapies how did it sort of work yeah so it's you you obviously you know people have their own rooms uh, and everything else everything is very structured um you have individual uh, psychotherapy uh depending on your treatment plan it could be psychiatrists it could be others uh on top of that you have a lot of group therapy there's a lot of different things you try uh that could be from art um through to meditation as well as some very challenging and painful sessions where you're sat in a room with people that you barely know talking about you know your worst memories and why you've done what you've done and why you're in the place that you are so yeah it's it, it, it's got comfy chairs and and they give you food but equally when the place goes into lockdown it goes into lockdown and then you know that you're in a, in a facility and it's um yeah it's serious stuff hmm. I mean, in terms of the treatment, I, um, I only sort of asked this because I watched, um, there was a program on BBC on iPlay the other day. Um, I think it's the drug trial experiment. I don't know if you caught it, where they're, um, they're testing cyclobin from magic mushrooms. Um, and effectively, they're, they're doing it as a treatment and essentially giving people a trip, similar to what you're saying, you know, you're, you're in a room. And um, it was very interesting that, you know, it, it effectively took people inside themselves, made them really think about what was going on. Um, and generally, the, it, it seemed to be uh, an active effect. And um, the problem at the moment is, I think, obviously, it's not it's not licensed and it's still, you know, it's still a drug, unfortunately, it's still illegal. But um, it's interesting. I mean, how did you find, because obviously that, that's one treatment, but, you know, were you on quite a lot of medication at the time? And did that help? And did you obviously have to come off it at some point? Yeah, I mean, the, the medication is, it's there as a crutch. I guess it takes the edge off. It helps, but does it does it stop the feelings? Does it make you magically feel better? I, I was quite disappointed. I'd heard about, you know, these these pills that were going to make me dreamy and everything else, but it was, it was nothing like that. It, it took the edge mm -hmm. off. Um, you know, there's different, there's, I think there's something like 47 different, um, antidepressants um so it's a lot of trial and error what works for you what doesn't work for you uh, what are the side effects like unfortunately a lot of them have have side effects and you know how can you manage those does does that make, actually make you worse does it make you better so it's it's a lot of it, experimentation as far as the drugs are concerned but not in a good way well, I was talking to one of my the other day and he's on antidepressant and, and he was saying that effectively they they stop him reacting to things that he would have reacted to. So if something happens in his life, obviously 
he doesn't react to it because he's on this medication. So rather than actually being a cure in any way, it's literally just uh, sort of stopping you reacting to an, a, an external incident or an external uh, an outcome. I mean, is, is that a fair way of sort of describing them? You say you sort of, they sort of take the edge off? Yeah, I, I think from my experience and everybody's experience is different and you know, I'm still on them today. And I think a lot of people remain on the on the antidepressants for a long time. It, it does take the edge off. And how I view it is it buys you a couple of seconds in that if you were going to react in a certain way, in a negative way, it gives you perhaps that couple of seconds to think, actually, is that the way you want to react? Is that the way you need to react? So by that, you know, it just gives you that that little bit of extra room to 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 react and uh, yeah, deal with deal with situations, you know, whatever that situation is, whether it's walking into a party when you really really don't want to go to a party or anything like that. Although we all want to go to parties now, but you know, the, the socialization, the the anxieties around that, whatever it is that should trigger, whatever it is that starts you off and and sets you down, whatever route it is, whether it's catastrophizing or whatever it gives you that little bit of room to say, okay, actually, yeah, you've broken a glass, but does that really mean she's going to leave you? Mm, probably not, Phil, probably not. Take a step back from that, take a step back from that. So it's probably more than that. So do you feel that helps? <sighs> it's, it's interesting. It's, you know, I guess like any drug, it becomes an addiction and the fear is, well, what if I come off them? I mean, I mean, as good a place as I probably have been for many, many years. So if I come off them, or do I risk the, the chance that I'm going to go backwards? I'm going to go back to where I was before. Um, so there is, strangely, there's anxiety about stopping it and coming off it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. If you could guarantee I could come off them but still feel as I feel now, then, yeah. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't, I think it helps me at the moment. Yeah, Double P, he said that he's been on them for eight years and made him feel like a zombie, numbed all feelings, killed his emotions, dose has been reduced, but he'll always have to be on them. I mean, does that sort of ring true with some of the things you've been through? Yes, uh, yeah, and, you know, I think it depends on your on your condition and where you are. I mean, you would see some people in the Priory that would be, and, and zombie is, is, is a great description. Um, you could see they were completely zoned out, but that would be the medication that they were yeah. on. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, uh, like double P there, you know, we've cut that down. You know, we're I'm on a lot lower dosage now. Um, and, you know, so it brings you out of that state. It brings you... You know, you're you're balancing that whole time between that numbness and that fear of well, I don't really want re reality, or I don't want it to feel like it used to. So it's a, it's a real balancing act, I think. And is it combined with are you still having counselling, are you still having seeing therapists, or is it is it just the medication at the moment? It's just the medication at the moment. I mean, for me personally, I've sat in probably enough rooms talking about my childhood. It doesn't change my childhood. It doesn't change the way my parents dealt with me. Um, I just now I'm in a better position to understand it. And the reason I feel like this is because they did that or, or whatever. So it, it, the therapy has really helped me sort of link those bits together. But you know, doing it again or continuing to do it, I find find other things. You know, like playing 45s, like. Riding, yeah. riding yeah. my bike, like whatever it is that gets you away, that gives you that that headspace, um, that yeah, switches you off from that constant feeling of anxiety. Hmm. All right, we'll, we'll come back to forty fives in, in, in a minute. Um, Demelz, I mean, I think you you know similarly, you've you've told me that you know you, you've had sort of battles of depression. I mean, it, it, does a lot of what Phil say ring true with you? And you know, have you been on medication? I'm I'm on medication now and I funnily enough my friend Cleo who's this most incredible woman she's an art therapist and a graffiti she runs graffiti uh, groups and stuff I was chatting the other day and I just said look I you know I really feel I should come off these tablets now and and she said look if you need to be on them be on them and I I'm just I feel totally anxious about 
how I'm going to feel if I come off them because I know if I miss them I feel terrible if I forget to take them I just I yeah it's horrific I will my world falls apart <laughs> around me um yeah and is it, and, is it that instantaneous that if, if you miss a dose it it does hit you straight away it is, yeah if I, if I miss one dose um I yeah yeah and um, I don't want to I mean I, I was diagnosed last year with um underactive thyroid which uh I'm not just fat it's thyroid <laughs> um so I take medication for that now I've gone from last year being on no medication to to I think I take like six tablets a day now so I'm on like leather thyroxine duloxetine and I'm on a I've got a chronic pain condition as well so I'm on a painkiller for that which doesn't really help at the moment but they're up in my dose so um yeah it's it's kind of strange so I was a bit like look I, I just feel like I'm taking too many too many meds but I I, I think Cleo was right you know I just need to not panic about it and just just deal with it and and you know when I feel ready to to come off them to come off them I mean I I, I have never been in the, the situation that Phil's been in at all and that you know I mean that's that sounds heavy really heavy and and I feel for you completely um and I can still see that it you know it deeply affects you and that's you know that's that's really hard um I'm learning stuff every day how to cope. I mean, I do you think that um, I'm I'm huge. I'm all for therapy. I think therapy is an incredible tool. I think talking, as cliched as it is, I think it's just it's phenomenal. But I think, like you said, Phil, sometimes you've talked enough about it. You don't want to talk about that anymore. You you need to learn um, uh, about coping mechanisms for dealing with those situations and I think you just get to a point where yes I know this happened in my childhood let's just move on because I don't you know I've spent enough time doing it and, and I think actually you kind of have to do that because it's going to stay with you forever I mean it's probably always going to be there but you want to move on don't you and you don't want to have to just continually go on about it so yeah therapy is phenomenal and I re recommend it um, I'm not in therapy at the moment but I am going to go back into it soon um partly because my job is tough and I, I need to vent about my job yeah. and, and uh, you know, sometimes have a cry and a rant in a, in a safe space. Um, and because, you know, I'm discovering other things that screw me up sometimes. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 like I said, I also want to move on and, and I guess it's about learning coping mechanisms and how to deal with situations. And it's also just talking to someone who's not your partner, your, your family member, your friend or, or anything, you know, I mean, I've, I, I, literally had a few sessions of counseling this year but, you know, i've never been in that position before um but it's it's amazing about how you know just talking to someone lets it out almost like a stream of consciousness and then you sort of it makes you think about other things and it's yeah i mean talking is really important you know it, it's it's one of the reasons obviously I, I started this show you know i mean talking to double p and him saying well i, I think for me with him it was um he sent me a message saying that James, his son, Minimal P, um, wanted to say thank you to me and Rob and Marky, um, you know, for, for helping him through depression. And that, you know, that, that really struck a chord, you know, that really struck a chord. And at that stage, I sort of realised, well, you know, we, we I can do something a bit more. We can do something a bit more with that. And, you know, playing music to each other is, is good. And it's one thing, but obviously, you know, there's there's things that are much more important. And people are going through a lot and especially the last year and a half, you know, on top of everything else that everyone's been through and you know, on top of everything else that all my guests have been on, um, you know, this last year has been, well, it's like nothing we've ever known before. And it's just more pressure and more difficulties piled on top. Um, Phil, um, one of the things you said is that is that music and, and 45s in particular helped you sort of come through some of these um, issues that you had, you know, it, when did that start? How did it, how did it manifest itself? How did it help? You know, why is music a help to you? Well, well, music's always been uh, like Demelza. Um, music's always been a very big part of my life. I mean, the if there are positive uh, memories from my childhood, I've got a sister that's uh, six and a half years, six and a half years older than me, which enabled me to listen to her music and and even at a young age i remember she went through the whole new romantic stage and there was you know duran duran posters here there and everywhere and things like that um 
And then from there, when my parents did split up, um, one of my stepbrothers, it was it was quite strange because my sister had dated some bikers in the past and they'd all been into heavy metal uh, and everything oh, else. God. My parents my parents split up, stepbrother, motorbike, leather jacket, as she had made the assumption he's going to play heavy metal like I'm used to. And he stuck disco on. And he played I sat in the corner whilst he played disco tracks back to back, which was was fantastic. Um and then with my friends we would start going to gigs and we'd go and see we'd go and see anybody. We would be we'd go and see Cameo on a Saturday, uh Erasure on a Sunday and probably Westworld on a Monday. Um, you know, not long after that we'd throw Pop will eat itself in there, wonder stuff. But, you know, any, anything. If we could see anything, we would go, yeah. which was great. Yeah. But you had that, such a back catalogue of, of music that it just took you to bad places and, and, and bad bad memories. Yeah. So it was almost finding finding something new, but wanting to find that, that music, wanting to reconnect with music because it had been such a big part of my life and there was this you know this music shaped hole that i just needed to fill and i needed to i needed to listen to things so music <laughs> we, we've talked a lot on the show about how music takes you back um generally most of the guests have, have talked about it taking them back to a to a good memory um it's interesting obviously that it took you understandably back to you know the bad memories and all of that so you effectively had to what, what reconfigure your musical brain again and make new memories from from it, afresh. I think it was um, you know it's it's down to those coping mechanisms. It was I, I just couldn't. I was at that stage. I couldn't listen to whatever it was. You know, yeah. a Depeche Mode B side would take me back to what, whatever situation, and that would be. I don't want to remember that. But it was then realizing as much later on, after I'd managed to get back into some other music and had been been DJing and back into the 45s, that actually that that piece of music wasn't a negative, but it was actually a positive of, the, of that time that you, you had, I've got a, at least I've got a positive soundtrack, if you like, to, to, to places and times, even if those times weren't great. Yeah, because again, we just, uh, you know, how powerful music is, um, and it, and I think that's why. Well, I mean, it, it's a real passion. I mean, I think Demelza, you were saying, um, you were saying earlier on that um, I, I can't remember if it was just before we uh, came on air, but um, you were saying that obviously you DJ out, and and some people will come up and say, you know, they like the music or they enjoy you playing records, but then there's other people who just haven't got any interest in in music at all, and that that's that's quite a strange phenomenon, isn't it? Really? Yeah, um, I mean. I my friends, uh, you know, obviously, uh, I, they're into music. That's that's all I've known. But I have met people that are just not into music, and that's. But I guess it's like you know, I'm really into cooking and food as well. So you know, I'm really into clothes. Um, that's just what you're into, I guess. But for us, you know, not li not listening to music is just it's alien. It's in my life twenty four seven. You know, the radio yeah. is on, or I'm looking for something, or I'm buying music or you know it's it's always there if i'm i'm distressed i will listen to music uh if i'm happy yeah. i'll listen to music it's yeah well i think like most of us certainly us 45 addicts you know if, if you're not playing your 45s you're listening to someone else playing 45s or you're yeah, trying to well. buy 45 you know it's it's, um, it's it's just constant um and it that brings with it a, a, again a bit of an addiction doesn't it you know and i find myself even today you know I, I was saying to you both think a bit earlier you know i wasn't really feeling that great this afternoon and you know i, I just found myself looking on discogs and sort of going through records and all and it's it is an addiction but it takes you away you know for, for however long it takes you away from what you're thinking i will try not to think about um and the stresses of life and, and everything else that goes on but um Right, I'm come back to Phil. So um, you've done a little bit of streaming, but I think not not quite as much as as um, me and Demel as well. And, and I'll talk to Demel about that in a minute. But um, you've played some gigs quite recently. Um, you know, after quite a long break, you know, from not getting. Yeah. That, how, how was that? How did you feel? You know, you know, how did you feel the first gig sort of straight back out? 
I have to be honest, I, I loved it. I mean, it was okay. It's a little bit restricted. People are still sitting down, but I think to me, being able to play out, it's like I'm a different person. It's a character. It yeah. enables me to be yeah. someone that perhaps I'm not the rest of the time. And I just like playing. I just like playing music. So to have someone there reacting to it, whether that's you know tapping a foot or singing along or coming over yeah. and asking what a track yeah. is, it's like yeah, that I, that that interaction is great. And we did something quite locally uh, to here at a, a local cafe. Uh, a bar around the corner called called Nosh, and we had such such a great great evening. We we went from the start where the the owner was a little bit skeptical about putting it on to no, this has been fantastic. Let's do this every month. We've got to do this because it's bringing people together, and that was that was the joy of it to see so many people coming together again, as we discussed around around music. You know whether it's introducing them to new stuff or the stuff that they know and they can sing along to. It was bringing people together, but around music. And you know, were, were those people coming because there was an event on, or you were DJing, or did they just happen to be there anyway? And it, and it, you know, it sort of added to the event. You know, how did it work? Um, uh, a bit of both, uh, because of the table restrictions and, and things like that. Um, you know, people had to pre-book. So yeah, there was a couple of tables that friends came along, which was great to have their support. Yeah, but yeah. we've done a little bit of advertising and everything else, and other people came along and were intrigued or fancied a night out or thought, "What what else is there to do?" or whatever. So you brought a real cross section of people together: those that were curious, people that brought their families. So you know, like we were talking about earlier, with kids nowadays not knowing what a record yeah. is and everything yeah. else, there was you know a young family there, and you know they were kids were really interested and really wanted to know about you know how does that play music what does that do so yeah it was a real real cross section but it, again it was all based and built around that music how did you find so, again, earlier, how did you find with the kids who hadn't you know seen a record before were they completely bemused and and and, and you also told a story about i think your daughter earlier on about flipping the record over so yeah, I mean, it, it's reverse, I think, from our days when we went from uh, records to CDs, when you, for the first time we probably all turned it over and thought, what's on the other side? And then nothing played. And it was like, oh, yeah, OK, so this is only one side. It, it's the complete opposite. So, OK, so you play this side and then there's something else on the other. And, and yeah, so I, then my daughter was mind blown by it anyway you know because she's digital age and it just comes out of a phone and whatever i want to listen to so to actually have to own it and put it on and everything else but yeah i think it's the thing that freaks them out the most that you can turn it over and there's something else on the other side that's yeah yeah i keep i keep saying yeah. i think zia gets it you know yeah. i sort of tell her right, okay especially with a reggae track i was like right so this is the version and this is like an instrumental or whatever so certainly with hip-hop tracks you know she knows that some of them we um although she did on her last stream we don't play the a side because there might be some swear words in it <laughs> but um i don't know it, it doesn't seem to bother the sunday get down you know they play any sort of hip-hop and uh regardless of, <laughs> regardless of the yeah. lyrics um but um yeah um demelza um streaming i think we we spoke earlier about how when someone first suggested to you about you know why don't you do a stream that you know you just you know said no you know you didn't think you could do it you know talk us through how it came to be what your first stream was like and you know how it sort of progressed from there um so yeah i they they sort of said to me oh you should stream and i said no I just no no way no, nobody nobody wants to listen to me and uh see me listen to me and i yeah at confidence i guess i mean i i do um I'm very aware of my skill set. I'm very aware of uh, what I can and can't do. Um, and I'm in utter admiration of, of the likes of uh, Coco. And uh, just, yeah. you know, he's an absolute <laughs> machine. Um, and uh, yes, but, and I just thought, no, no, it's silly. Um, and then obviously I'm part of the Wax Nerds um, and uh, they've always been really encouraging. And um, we started doing it and I did it around at Mark's house um first of all 
and I was really nervous. I, I wouldn't talk on the mic. It was, I was, it was, I was co really conscious of my, you know, looking. Kept, and I've, I've been, I know I've been fiddling with my hair and stuff. I'm quite conscious of it. It's silly. Um, but yeah, I was, I was really nervous about it and self feeling, you know, a bit crap about myself and yeah, ridiculous stuff, which I know is ridiculous, but it's still there. It's, it's, you know, um, but I loved it. And I, you know, what I loved was everybody was really lovely and it wasn't, it wasn't, they weren't just blowing smoke up, up me. They were, you know, genuinely really kind, really nice and really encouraging, you know, and that, and it's lovely. And, and from there, I've gone on to meet um, and I believe form friendships with people who I would like to think I'm, I'm going to be able to meet in the real world at some point. Um, and, um, you know, it's brilliant. It's been brilliant. There's been a lot of Twitch hate. Um, I'm very much, you know, people bitch about so social media. Um, people moan about Twitch. And it is what it is. Enjoy it for what it is. You know, if, if someone is loving it and enjoying it, let them, let them love it and enjoy it, you know. What have you found in terms of Twitch? I mean, the, the, the only real negative things I've had is, is a lot of people are saying, okay, it's Amazon. Uh, it's Bezos, you know, we don't want to be promoting, you know, Twitch because he's making loads and loads of money. And yeah, I, I, I get that, you know, I get it. Um, but what, what do you mean by Twitch? Hey? What, what have you had or what have you, have you experienced? Um, I, I don't know what it is. There's, there's been a bit of negativity around, you know, some people are getting a bit too big for their boots and thinking they're superstars. And um, okay. I, I don't overanalyze anything really. I'm, I just, you know, I just think brilliant. Well done, you know, get congratulations on what you're achieving just be nice you know um and like i said it is what it is I, I i love it i love you know i look at my followers i've got like 252 now which is amazing and i'm, I'm loving that and um it makes me really excited when i get a new follower and i'm genuinely genuinely so grateful when people watch me play um yeah you know last night was terrible i kept being put off by matt love though being a misogynist um so <laughs> he was only joking though but uh oh well i don't know maybe he wasn't but um i think he wasn't the... i don't know if he's i don't know if he's still here <laughs> um but um yeah i mean it's 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 a strange one isn't it because you know I, I, yeah i get what you're saying about the twitch hate um but but the djs who have made it have put in a lot of hours a lot of, huge... work, a lot of Absolutely. networking you know they they, they and and they, they're really good most of them you know you know that's not a bit about the red bush um they are uh yeah matt love's still here <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah like you say i think it's it, it is it is a really supportive community um and you know there's always going to be someone there who's going to say great tune or or you know uh, and it's all, it's all supportive you know 99 percent of it is positive and you know, i think that, that, I think it's genuine as well. I don't. I yeah. don't think there's. I. You know, there might be. I don't know. Yeah. I like to think it's all genuine. But you know, I've been contacted by. I did a stream. These people in Hollywood contacted me, and I did a charity stream with them, yeah. and I did like a disco set, and that was really lovely. And then some people in like LA contacted me, and oh, it's just, it's just lovely. It's just a really yeah. nice thing. And you know, so what if someone wants to, yeah, do it and and you know. Um, big themselves up and make themselves better you know so what who cares you know let's big people up let's love people and just be kind to yeah. them you know there's enough hate yeah. in the world i think That's something you. that really sorry uh, chris no, i think on. something that no, i was just going to say that um something that really hit home for me um and i think some of the reason that i don't um stream very often is that i just we come back to that core belief of not being good enough. I just think other people are better and I prefer to listen to other people yeah. than make people listen to me. But I remember uh, a coffee and donuts uh, one week and yeah. there was a DJ on, I, I can't remember her name, but she started her stream and unfortunately there was no sound, no sound coming out. Okay. I think I've been, but I've been the chat just filled up with help support yeah. ideas have you tried this try this and and i i the, the the poor dj was obviously worried but the whole community just put her mind at rest and 
came up with ideas and within probably what felt for the DJ 10 minutes, but was probably 30 seconds, the sound was going yeah. and it was running. And then the chat then filled up with positive comments. And to me, I was, yeah, my fear, it's going to go wrong. But if people are that supportive, it's okay. I'm in a safe space. Pe people genuinely yeah. Yeah. want you to do well, want to hear what you're going to play and wish you the best. And, and, and I just thought that was that really summed up the community and uh, the people that we have on air. I mean, we've, we've said it before on here. It's, 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 it's really putting yourself out there. Um, you know, it's really putting yourself in a vulnerable position. I mean, it's, it's easy now for me to sort of sit back. You know, I've been doing it for a year. But, you know, it, it, it's, especially people who haven't done it before or, or don't do it that regularly, it's, it's a really vulnerable position to be in. And, and like, I think, we, I can't remember if it was before we started or not, but, Melody, you were saying that, you know, it's, it's everyone's watching you. Everyone's watching what you're doing. Everyone's watching, you know, are you, are you going to play this record? Are you going to play that record? You know, what are you going to say? And then there's this pressure, oh, you know, I should really be talking to the chat or I don't want to miss a comment that someone said. And, you know, it, you know, DJing in a bar becomes a lot easier because you're just playing music. Um, and I, I was saying to you earlier, you know, having gone back and done a little bit of that, it, it's very strange not having that interaction with the screen and, and the chat. And, you know, you're just literally playing music. And you're sort of thinking, oh, I should be talking or should be doing something. Um, but it is a, is a very vulnerable, but everyone has been, you know, so helpful, you know, people have helped me get to what I'm doing. Um, and like you say, you know, people will always help. Um, I think Mark Brand said it on one of the streams. Um, I can't I think Matt Bader might have been playing and I think the connection just wasn't in is, 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 is uh, cable just wasn't quite in his phone or something. Um, and he just said, oh, you know, it doesn't sound quite right. You know, just do this and that. And um, he said, he said, you know, friends don't, let their friends sound like tin cans i think is what he sort of came up with which is, which is very true you know you know we all want and and it, it, i think it came out i think on the when we did the 45 queen session um there was um the um oh, beat made oh, oh, i can't remember the names now from from um sweden i think there was the beat mermaids um and their, their their visuals were terrible you know it was like almost like a sort of dali painting or something but the sound was really good and they're like oh should we stop and everyone's like no 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 the, the music's brilliant keep going you know even though they can't you know they couldn't really see anything but you know it's so it's so supportive you know and everyone is so willing to help and and, and i think like you say it's a safe space you know you, you can go on there and you know most of the people in there are, are your friends friends or some some in real life some you know virtual friends and obviously like you say hopefully we're, we're all going to be meeting up at, at, at some point very soon i think um, um i um imposter syndrome now you asked me when um a couple of times to play 45 day i, I don't know last yeah. year the year before and i declined and uh, yeah. i have to i i was perplexed number one why you would even consider asking me um and i just i yeah, anyway, I just thought, no, that's ridiculous. You know, I, I couldn't, why would, why would I do that? You know, genuinely imposter syndrome and feel, you know, I'm not, I'm just not good enough to do that. So I turned you down and I regretted it, really regretted it. Um, you played to, you're, playing, you're playing for us in a couple of weeks on the 80s special. Yes, I am. Unless you've forgotten. No, 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 <laughs> no all in the diary. Um, along with, with the, the uh, and, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I do get that a lot, imposter syndrome, yeah. feeling, you know, what, what, who do you think you are, Lady Melza, you know, giving it the big one, playing your records. And sometimes I, you know, there's been times where I just don't post online because I don't feel good enough, really. Don't feel I should be doing it. But Yeah, I know, I know that one. I know that one. Sometimes someone else can play a record, the same record that I play, and it sounds so much better than when they play it than when I did. So let them play it because, yeah, it just doesn't sound as good when I do it. And I like that's my just in my head. That's just I'll in join my head. conversations and I'll know the answer or I will have an opinion on it. Um, but I won't join in the conversation because I just don't think I'm, I qualify to have that conversation, you know, which is really mm -hmm. sad because we're all, you know, I, I'm very, like I said, I'm very aware of, of my knowledge of, of, you know, what I do know. I have got knowledge. I do know stuff and I am, you know, I'm, I'm okay at what I do. Um, and, uh, but it's always really good to learn as well. I love learning. You know, I've met some insane people through, through playing records yeah. who are, you know, who are just, um, uh, there's a guy from Bournemouth who I've met, Tony the Pencil from Second to None Breakdance Crew. 
Yeah. Okay. And, you know, we are considered, I consider us to be friends now and we chat and I buy records off him and um, he always gives me a heads up on, on some records. Um, and, uh, you know, he's like this legend of, you know, he tells me stories about touring in, you know, in the early 80s in New York when, when they were breaking and, and the people that he'd met, you know, all my hip hop heroes. Um, and, and, you know, he's just incredible. So, you know, and I'm just like, wow, you know, these people like me. It's crazy. Yeah. And maybe that's the space that we're in. But, um, you know, what I mentioned earlier about listening to that Allergies album and it, it, it mm. being this this restart, this re-kick, um, I'm not sure which platform it was I, I did it on, but I felt, right, I, I want to say thank you to these guys and explain a little bit. And so I dropped them, dropped them a line to say, you know, thank you very much. You know, I, I love, I love the, I love the record, and you know, this is what I've gone through a little bit, and this is what, what it's done to me. So thank you. And they both wrote back, individually, yeah. not, yeah. you know, both of, them, both of them wrote back, which I didn't expect that in a million years. You know, you just want to say thank you, you just want to get out. But you know, they, 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 they interacted, they came back, and you know, they've always been very supportive of me, and you know. I yeah. Gen yeah. genuinely consider them friends now. And I think, again, maybe that's the environment and the community that, you know, no one's too big, no one's too special. We're all in this together and yeah, we've all got a shared passion. I tell you where it all goes. Where it all when you go record shopping, no, no friendship there. Or <laughs> <laughs> the friendship ends. I'm yeah, gone. Okay. All right. I remember I'm that. experienced friends around, but no, they they don't know you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Ouija um, has also been a guest on the show. Um, it says it's difficult to find your tribe, especially in this current climate. And I, I think that that's true on a, on a number of levels. I mean, obviously, I think um, we're all slightly older you know some some younger than others but um you know i think i think as you get older you know it's it's perhaps not as easy to make friends or you know you, you might get stuck with you know people you do sports with or people you know who are parents at, at your school and whatever and i think i think you know those are not they're sort of friendships but they're not you know they, they're only a friendship because you, you your kids happen to be in the same class or something like that you know it's very different um but i think th this is definitely been a massive community and, and and like you say phil you know no, no one is no one's too big you know i mean you know obviously I'm, I'm, i haven't been messaging coco um because he is that <laughs> legend but, but you know even even some of the other you know massive djs who've been part of you know 45 day and you know 45 kings and 45 you know it's it, it's amazing to think that you know a couple of years ago you know you couldn't just sort of drop someone a message and say right you know i'm doing this show or whatever do, do you want to come on and and, and play or um, it, it's a real great leveler, um, and and I don't know. It's it's difficult because obviously you know we only spend time within the forty fives community. Um, I don't know if it's happened in the same way as say, for example, the, the ghetto funk community or the or the drum and bass community or you know the the, the hip hop community. I mean, I, I would imagine it probably has in some form, but I think because we've got a passion about a, a I mean, it's weird, isn't it? It's a particular musical format that you know, we all love so much that has brought us together. It's, it's, if you think of it in that term, it's really weird, isn't it? It's like people sort of going crazy about 78s or something. You know, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it is a bit strange, but also very cool at the same time. Yeah. And on that very, you know, clean segue, should we move on to 45s that lift the spirits? Yeah. Um, Demel, should we start with you? What, what have you got? And again, big shout out to Mark Lancaster. He came up with this uh, segment. Um, I think it was one of the one of the questions he raised in the very first show we did uh, with Double P and Mr. Musto. And it's, and it's a great it's a great question. And we've done it ever ever since. OK, so um, I'm going to start with the first 45 that I ever bought. OK, wow. Wow. That's a good one. And this is officially the 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 one. And I I'm quite cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, w. H. Smith's in Camborne, um, and uh, yeah, so this this is just phenomenal. And uh, I I just remember Good. learning all the words and uh, just being this weird kid that liked wasn't quite sure about. I, I love drums, but I I didn't quite know what it was or, or how to find it. So first first forty five I bought. Just to interrupt briefly, Mark's yeah. made a very good comment in response to your um, 
pursuit friendships go out the window as soon as you're record collecting <laughs> survival yeah. of the fittest <laughs> digger <laughs> survival of the fittest that is very that's that brilliant is very ends at the oh, door yeah that is brilliant <laughs> um okay so um something that um i was really lucky to see uh this band in las vegas uh, a couple of years ago and it's um an album that I grew up listening to from a little girl, which is the Rumours album. And uh, this is Songbird, um, okay. Fleet Mac. Sorry, it's not in its its cover because I haven't got it. But um, yeah, so Songbird by Fleetwood Mac. Um, it reminds me of my mum and uh, I probably cry every time it goes on, but I just adore it so much. It's just really special. And when, when they came on stage in Las Vegas, I just, I cried. Um, and it was a phenomenal gig. And Mick Fleetwood is an insane drummer. He's mental. I think he must be microdosing as well. <laughs> he, he went. He went all crazy. So yeah. Okay. So this is my first foray into hip hop, which is a huge love of mine. Um, my best friend's brother uh, was a hip hop DJ in Cornwall called Bex, um, and I said to him one day because I'd heard. I think I'd heard Chad Jackson on the radio and like the break and the drums. And I was like, wow, yeah. that's I just love it. And um, I said, have you got like any hip hop that I can listen to? And he did me a mixtape. Um, and this. Yeah. So this for me is, is one of the very first hip hop records that I really heard and, and became obsessed with. So um, I only recently acquired this as well. Um, so uh, yeah, caveman, I'm ready. Would so, you describe yourself as a big hip hop fan now then? Sorry? Would you describe yourself as a big hip hop fan now? Yeah, but I'm stuck in the kind of 80s and 90s still, which isn't a bad thing, is it? 80s or 90s music or 80s or 90s hip hop? Uh, a bit of both, really. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly love the, the earlier, earlier sort of days, hip hop. Big Daddy Kane, you know, yeah. that, that kind of era. Chub Rock, that whole... Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, yeah. I've never felt I've never felt whiter when I play hip hop. I feel, I feel quite for forty four year old woman playing old school hip hop. I do feel quite random, um, but I love it. I yeah, absolutely there's nothing wrong with that. I love the, it. Uh, we had we had DJ Misbehavior playing um, on the forty five Queens, and you know, I, I before I'd invited her, I sort of hadn't really realised who she was, but because. I'd seen the video from however many years ago it was where she was completely rocking some university in, in America. And you can see the crowds going wild and it turns around and there's like a middle-aged white woman sort of <laughs> playing it. And you're like, this is amazing. Um, and then she came and played on the show. You know, it was um, yeah. brilliant. Oh, she's so good. She was so good. Yeah, you know, I, I, I do I do sometimes feel a bit awkward, but, you know, I love hip-hop. I And, uh, you know, female vocal and female hip-hop as well, I just adore. So a lot of my sets, there is a lot of vocal. But, you know, I yeah. love it. Well, it's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's nothing wrong. I think, you know, we can play. And that's one of the beauties of Twitch. You can play pretty much whatever you want. And it doesn't matter. You know, no one's going to judge you. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Three great choices. Uh, Phil, on to you. What have you got for us? Okay, so these are these are songs that I, records that I play now that, yeah, most definitely make me feel good. And, you know, there's, there's memories, recent memories attached to them. The first one. I first heard whilst I was in the Priory and for that short period of time each day that you're allowed your phone. Um, I was on Discogs trying to get a copy after hearing it on Craig Charles. So it's, um, and like you, I don't have the uh, covers for it, but the uh, Muscle Shoal Horns and Born to Get Down, put that there. Um, it's, 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 um, it's the 45 I probably get asked about the most when I play it out live, mm -hmm. as in, what is what is that? What is that? And it's, yeah, it's just a feel-good 45, funky, that, yeah, it just makes me feel good. Enjoy it. Great. That's a good one. Okay. Now, actually, I don't think I've got that one. Okay. Um, undisputed truth, you plus me equals love. Just a, yeah. just makes me feel so good. It's just just a pleasure to play. Um, I struggle not to play it every time I'm playing <laughs> out. It's just 
yeah, it's it's a guilty pleasure, but I just I just love this, love it. It's got a great feel to it. So yeah. Mark Lancaster's got doubles of that one. Oh, it's a good stuff. And the third one, I probably couldn't go without an allergies song, and I had to, you know, decide which one it was. But uh, I've gone with Heartbreaker, um, which is off yeah. the first first album. Some of it because the flip is it's Big Bird done by Smooth, um, so you get two for the price yeah. of one. Um, and yeah, yeah. Again, it's another feel good track. It's just just something that gets people moving. People asking, "What is that?" Um, I have a terrible trouble mixing with it because it's on the offbeat, and I could never get it right. But it's just a pleasure to play. So, yeah, they're my three. Great, yeah. three great songs. So obviously, I, I've I have to do this each time. So I was thinking today about what you know, what lifts my spirits, and I think I, I think you know the fact that. Zia, ZZ45 is so much into um, music and, and 45s. Um, that, that, you know, that lifts my spirits. You know, every time, you know, she gets on the decks or wants to play. And, and so I've chosen three tracks that she, well, four technically, that she particularly loved. Um, first one is uh, The Bell Stars, which is a clapping song. Um, she used to love this. And, you know, it, it was in one of my mixes and, you know, we listened to one of my mixes in the car and she'd always sort of you know singing along to that you know 369 and, and all the rest of it so you know every time I hear that it lifts me um and then bizarrely this because I used to love this when I was a lot younger I used to be a huge fan of, of Huey Lewis and the news um obviously back in the day of back to the future um and this is hit to be square because she um she goes to musical theater and then I picked her up a few weeks ago and then she was like oh we've done this new song you know do you know it and then she starts singing i was like yeah i know that hit me square <laughs> and then straight onto discogs bought it and then yeah she loves it it's, it's in her collection and then um another one that I, I i think it's a bit of a guilty pleasure i mean i i, I still like it now but um it, it's featured in a i don't know if it's pixar or disney i think it's pixar film uh madagascar but uh i like to move it <laughs> Is uh classic, and then I was like, Oh, I get the other one, then there's the go on move as well, which I got. But, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, her being into 45s and her listening to music and you know, listening to one of my mixes and saying, Oh, what's this song? Can I play it in one of my sets? You know, that definitely lifts my spirits. Um, and that, but yeah, as Adam says, no pleasure should be guilty, and yeah, I think all, all kids love that. Um, Constance K is in, I'm, I'm gonna give Constance K a shout out. She, um, if you don't know, she's uh, cut class Adam Bell's other half. And uh, Adam, I bought some records off uh, Adam's label and she sent me a, a 45. We haven't heard this story. Um, it's, uh, she said, oh, here's a track from, from my band, Funky uh, Farty Freak. Oh, I can't remember. Funky Farty Freaks, I think it is. And it's fart number one. And, and Zia found that hilarious, but it's one of her favourite tracks. So I always give Constance a big shout out for that. Yeah. And cut past. Um, oh. Right, we're gonna. Sorry, we can you... power couple. No. Power couple, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They're playing on coffee and donuts. Actually, they're doing an hour set each in oh. July, so that should be an interesting couple of hours. Um, Constance was a guest on um, Forty Five Funksters uh, a little while ago. Um, right, I'm, we're going to move on to the to the last section, but if anyone's got any questions, stick them in the chat and then we'll, we'll answer them if anyone's got anything. So, confectionery corner, I think it's probably why, one of my favourite sections. Um, what have you got, Demelza? What have you got for us today? Oh, God, I'm so boring and predictable. Oh, Matt, it's all about what you like. Car, that is good. Classic. Car is good. And I kind of, um, I mean, the Americans have taken over now, so it's not quite as good um the advert the rabbit she was like really beautiful yeah. and i think everyone fancied her didn't they because she was like the sexy rabbit um so yeah childhood memories and i used to really like it when it was in the foil wrap container but uh yeah cabri's yeah. um it was um, going to be a whip as well but i couldn't find one so i had to opt for my uh walnut whips are good yeah, but yeah. I don't like the walnuts, so I take the walnut off. They do. So I think Marks and Spencers do some slightly different versions of them, which are the very Marks nice. 
one is actually nicer than the original. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it was it was a close run between that rabbit and Jessica Rabbit, wasn't it? From yeah. um, yeah. from, the, from our, we from our we from a West girl, so you know, I had to go with the yeah. uh, the Bristol Rabbit. Yeah. Anything else, or is that? That's what you got. That's it. Sorry, yeah, that that. No, no, don't, don't complain. It's a classic. I'm more, a, I'm more of a cheese board kind of gal. Okay, we might have to add a new section in then cheese, yeah. cheese and wine <laughs> section. Good yeah. idea. Cheese right. and board. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, here, here's a question: Which cartoon rabbit did you fancy most? Are we just keeping it to those two, or are we opening it out to any? That's any funny. Cartoon rabbit? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I don't know, just probably Jessica Rabbit, I suppose. I don't know, she was a bit more, a bit more slutty, wasn't she? A bit more human ish. I don't know, is that even a word? It's not even a word, <laughs> is it? Caramel Rabbit is a bit more innocent, yes, yeah. So that says a lot about you, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Demel. Uh, we'll move on to Phil. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Here we go. Hold on. Controversy coming in. Roger Rabbit and Jessica yeah. Rabbit wasn't Rabbit. Okay. We all stand connected. Thank you, Sideshow. Welcome. <laughs> all right. Specifics. <laughs> yeah, where were you earlier, Sideshow? I needed you to ban a couple of people. Um, but anyway, um, if Bill, what have, you, what have you got for us? Uh, okay, so I, I, I've... Uh... I've brought a few. Um, one I know has been on the show before, but it's uh, again from from my youth, and yeah, it's the classic. Yeah, Caramac, uh, an acquired taste of some, but yeah, reminds me of yeah getting my um, money from a paper round and then giving it straight back to the news agent in the chocolate that I would buy at the time. So. Uh, yeah, that was that's my first how, one. How, how my much second one back then. How much was power match, you think? Oh, it, it was less than ten p. That's crazy, isn't it? I remember less than ten p. Being ten p or going with ten p to the your local news agents and being able to fill up a bag of like one penny sweets. Yeah, you know. And I, I also work on the theory, like Milky Bars, Caramax and Milky Bars. They're better when they're thinner. They taste different. It's yeah. like yeah. Milky Bar. If you buy a big big bar, it doesn't taste the same. Small one, yeah, it's got a different taste to it. Um, my Caramax. second one, big, big fan big. of – sorry? I was going to say, Caramax is very popular on this show. Yeah, it looks like it, doesn't it? Uh, Mark good. loves it. And it's been in before. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've seen it on the show before, but, yeah. Um, my second yeah. one, big fan of Fusion um, chocolate bars. So – might okay. split the audience, but the uh, let's put it that way, not the white chocolate Twix. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about those. I've had them. I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. I don't know. No, I like it. It's it's sweet. It's it it's without yeah. doubt sweet. And now they do a salted caramel one as well. So yeah, I've, I've had that one. Um, I think the caramel is a bit. It feels a bit sugary in it. It's almost like got yeah. stuff in it. It's not quite right. I don't know, but uh, yeah. But yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's a good choice. It's a good choice. Okay. And, and my final one is, is interesting. You mentioned uh, Marks and Spencer's because they they just do a range of uh, chocolate, bags of chocolate. I don't know whether you've seen them. And oh. their caramel filled buttons. It, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a little bit like that bit in uh, Pulp Fiction when they're discussing the heroin. When you eat those, you know why you've paid more for those caramel filled buttons than any other <laughs> caramel filled buttons. The trip that you were on from those is a different level. So they're they're effectively the Mark Spencer's version of the caramel buttons. Yeah. You know, the dairy milk, mate. Yeah, yeah. I'm I might have to go and try and say, get some of those. Um right, okay. So um again it's been on the show, but I didn't have them because my daughter had eaten them all. Oh, well, I would eat them all, but um coconut mushrooms i've actually got some left although she still made me open the bag today to have some um i think it was sideshow more was asking what they are um and then i don't know if you can really see that but it's like a coconut no sorry too bright coconut mushrooms they're classic and um you get them from a charity shop so you can sort of uh, give them back to charity as well 
Um, and then unfortunately, these ones didn't actually make it to the show, but they are some of my favorite sweets. Um, Swedish fish. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they had these before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they didn't really make it. And also, there wasn't very much in the packet, which was a bit disappointing. There's about IKEA did massive bags of them. Yeah. Yeah. I love them from IKEA. Um, and then these, and these again haven't made it very, very long. You know, I kept telling Zia, they're for my show, they're for my show. She's like, oh, can we just have one? And then they don't last. Uh, Mike <laughs> and Ike, these are mega mix sours. Um, I don't know, they, they're really good sweets. Little, little do them during um, when they do America Week and they have them and they're much cheaper. The, these are from the oldie sweet shop in a little village we went to last week on holiday, whatever it was. Um, but yes, we haven't got any. Uh, where are we? No Dickman's sideshow. Um, <laughs> so Constance, um, I think, was in Canada before. Is that right? Uh, I assume some of those Mike and Ikes and would have probably been there. Um, but I think they're American generally. Um, right. Has anyone got any questions in the chat or have you two got any questions? Anything you want to ask? I don't think so. You don't have to. Um, <laughs> Pressure, the pressure. Yeah, I didn't no. expect that. He didn't say he was going to do that, no, did he? Chocolate, yeah. Yeah, I'm just salivating over the <laughs> over the sweets. But, yeah. Um, you're not you're not jumping into them. I think we had um, when we had Ouija and um, Rob, Mr. Lob on. You know, they're like sitting there, like chomping into the. You know, couldn't even answer any questions. But um, Constance from Chicago. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here's a good question. Here's a good question. Um, not that one. Love Border, favourite crisps. And then I've got another one from Cut Class as well. Okay, so favourite crisps. Demelza, I'm putting you on the uh, spot. Brand or flavour? Specify Love Border. Uh, yeah. Those are vague. Um, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite Both. boring. Um, I love a Walker's Plain Crisp or a Salt and Shake. Um but salt, salt and vinegar, shake. salt and yeah. vinegar. If I'm gonna go if, if I'm wanting some because I love vinegar, so anything quite strong. So yeah, quite quite boring. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm thinking at the moment. Cheese, cheese and onion uh, Ringos back in the day were were good. Used to used to like a Ringo. Still remember the advert. Um, and a hula hoop. Now they, they they now seem to pop them rather than just give you. The traditional ones, which are full of air, yeah, they seem to go very quickly in our house. So uh, yeah. they're good. They're good. So we're getting quite a lot of uh, cheese and onion walkers. What's the sauce? I love um, this as well. Yeah, I, I, I like my crisp as well as you can probably tell. But um, I quite like the the new giant flaming hot watsits. They're a bit more. Mm. They're not massive. They're probably about that big, um, but they're quite good. Um, KFC Zinger Crisps from Walkers. No, I haven't had those. I'm not a big KFC fan. I had Brussels um, sprout ones at Christmas. Canny packet of Tudor. I don't I don't know what, what that is. I think they're a brand, aren't they, from Scotland, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Maybe I'll have no, someone I go. Well. <laughs> the answer is sort of vinegar disco. Sort of vinegar discos is um yeah, they are they are good. They are good. And cheese balls cheaper than better. <laughs> right. We have one more question, unless anyone else has anything after that. And again, another difficult one. Tamalzi, you can go first. Oh, Best song to close out the set. Uh, I sometimes like. One. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, 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 I don't know. Um, I like going completely off the scale with something completely different to what I've been playing. Um, I don't know, what do I end it with? Grace Jones, Jamaican guy the other day. Um, Promise Land. It depend, depends what I'm playing, but yeah, I, Promise Land's quite a good one because that gets everyone up. Um, yeah. Yeah, probably Promise Land. That's a good one. Phil? <clears throat> um, I, have, I have two favourites, I think, that, that, that I go to, usually because by the time I'm getting to the end, most people have left. But um, <laughs> the, uh, the the Dusty Donuts uh, version of Get Down um, yeah. is, is a nice one to, to close the evening out. 
or these boots are made for walking. I sometimes chuck that on at the end. Um, and uh, yeah, finish to that. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's um, it's 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 putting on something that's a little bit different sometimes. Um, I think for me, the wrong Tom edit um, of General Levy, um, incredible, definitely. It, it just it just always gets people going, um, and it's and it's just leaving you know as 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 a great as a great ending. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's it. Unless anyone else has got any more questions, I think we are there. That's great. Right, thank you both of you for being amazing guests. Um, really good. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Um, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the, the the support. Again, we were saying about this earlier, but you know, the the support we get on this show, um, and everyone's here and everyone's tuning in, and you know. People stick around and they listen and you know they can empathize with what's going on and um you know thank you again for just being open and honest and, and and sharing your experiences it's been it's been a real pleasure to talk to to both of you um sideshow okay yeah it's gonna be like okay all right um all right i'll talk for another couple of minutes sideshow and then we'll, we'll raid over and see you um so just tip me when you're live and we'll, and we'll go from there um but yeah so um phil when are you next out playing? Um, playing at Overdraft down in Southampton, or surely just outside Southampton this Friday night. Um, when yeah. I booked it, I didn't realise it was England, Scotland, but so what? I much prefer to be playing 45s anyway. Um, <laughs> might stick a copy of World in Motion in the bag just in case. But uh, yeah, so, so Friday, which is... Uh, Overdraft have been really supportive as well. They've got two places this way, one in Winchester, one in Southampton, that they always have DJs on and set up to play music. And uh, yeah, they're, they're really great, really great. Yeah, I was playing yeah. on, uh, yeah, yesterday <laughs> um, as part of Raiders of the Lost Art. And um, it's only sort of on Saturday I suddenly realised that the England game was on at, um, at exactly the time I was playing. Um, but, you know, it's, it is what it is, you know. Mm, definitely. Uh, here we go with a, a silly question. How much wood would a wood chop chop if a wood chop wood chop wood? <laughs> I'm not sure there's an answer to that. Uh, right, Sideshow's live. So, um, Demels, I'm just going to see. When when are you playing again? Uh, well, I was due to support Crafty Cuts on the 2nd of July. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Morris had other plans today, though, didn't he? Uh, yeah, I'm doing a four-week thing with my friend at, uh, at my friend's pub which is a great little venue. Um, so yeah, he, he, my friend Spider is um phenomenal disco DJ, disco boogie. Um, and I love playing with him and learning with him and he's, he's educated me in so much. So yeah, no, looking forward to that. Um, and yeah, just some streams really. Cool. Right. I'm just going to set the raid in motion before I, before I forget how to do it. Well, oh, raiding. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's next level. Next level. <laughs> I've got it right. Okay, I've got it there. I'm just going to tell you what's coming up um, next on the show. Oh, I'm switching screens. Um, right. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we've got coming up. So um, before I do that, obviously, if you'd like to talk to anyone about mental health issues, there's, there's plenty of organisations out there. There's mind.org.uk. Time to change uh, mental health, Samaritans, the calm zone, UK November. And as we say um, on the show, you know, just, you know, we're all here. We're all supportive. And, you know, we're all at the end of a phone or the end of Messenger or the end of Instagram or whatever. You know, if you, you, know, if you want to just, just you know, send me a message, send anyone a message and, um, you know, we'll, we'll give you as much time as, as you need. And, you know, it, I've made a lot of good friends through this and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to give back and, and be as supportive as I can for everyone else. Um, next week, we're back on the music. Uh, 21st of June is 45 Beats and Breaks. We've got Chrome, Groove the Most, DJ Magnificent, and myself. After that is 45 Raiders, Sam Tweaks, The Gaff, myself and special guests. 
Fourth uh, of July, really looking forward to that. Um, the guys met ZZ a bit earlier. Yeah. We're starting a 45 kids show. So me and ZZ are going to talk to some of the other 45 kids. Uh, Mr. Lob and JS, Chrome and Evie Wonder. And we're going to be raising some money for Jesse's Fund, which is a charity that helps with music therapy for children in children's hospices and children with special needs and um, possibly be speaking to someone from the charity. And then the next episode of this show is on the 12th of July. I'm talking to DJ Babs and her husband, Derek, um, and also DJ Nico. So all uh, from Canada. So that's going to be an interesting show. And then 13th, 14th, 15th of August is way off, but we're doing another three-day mental health awareness raid train with Double P. So hope you can join us for some or all of those shows. Uh, thank you once again. And we'll go and see Sideshow. If you guys hang there for a minute, I'll have a quick chat to you. And then um, everyone else say hello to Sideshow and see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thanks.